So welcome everyone to um, another in our series of programs on being a citizen. I'm Frank Martin, director of the IP STEMIC Museum at South Carolina State University. And it's my great pleasure today to have with us, uh, I hope both of the filmmakers from uh, shared history, but certainly we have uh, Vivian Glover, who is a journalist and NBC News uh, producer, who is here to talk about the experience of making this film. The film was originally conceptualized by Felicia Furman and so I'm going to give a brief overview of the museum and an introduction to our collections to contextualize our discussion about shared history. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and begin. So this program is presented by the IP Stemic Museum and Planetarium at South Carolina State University. And um, it is co-sponsored in part by the South Carolina Progressive Network. And the museum, uh, is scheduling a series of events as part of a celebration of um, the Twigs Rose Festival, which is Dr. Leo Twigs was the uh, actually founding director of the IP Stanback Museum. And uh, in order to honor him and his contributions to education and to art education across our state and across the nation, and his teacher, Professor Arthur Rose, we've decided to do a month long series of events celebrating the arts and part of that uh, month-long celebration, which involves both Claflin University, South Carolina State University, and Orangeburg Technical College, as well as other partners, like I'm right now pre presenting the program from the Orangeburg County uh, Public Library. Uh, we are celebrating uh, institutions of higher education and the HBCUs in our community. And this program is supported in part by the Orangeburg County Council. And some of you will be familiar with the IP Stimmett Museum from uh, at South Carolina State University, which is located on the campus. And it is a museum and planetarium so that there's a unity of the uh, expressive arts, the sort of interior experiences of creative artists uh, joined in the same facility with the uh, discovery of the nature of the universe, the foundational materials of our planets and of the very foundations of human life. And so we like to think of this facility, which is unique among HBCUs, in fact, to have a museum and planetarium combined as a way to help our students engage with both their inner universe, their uh, subjective internal reality, as well as the outer universe, the objective material things, the physics of how we exist. And this is just an uh, image of our principal exhibition space. There will be an opening for the um, new exhibition on materials, memory, and metaphor, as well as the 50th anniversary of our student uh, exhibitions, our student shows will open next Wednesday in the museum facility, and you'll have a, a reception for that uh, activity. So if you have not had an opportunity to come to the museum, everyone is welcome to come and visit. And this is our main gallery. And as part of our museum's permanent collection, we collect African and African-American artifacts. Uh, what we do is celebrate the um, various expressions of the African diaspora, uh, but we are able, of course, to show works by artists from any background, from many different backgrounds, but our permanent collection is made up of works primarily from uh, artists of the African diaspora. And the uh, image you see on the screen right now, these are the Eri Beji, which are Yoruba twin figures uh, as part of the spiritual practice among the Yoruba ethnic group in uh, uh, Nigeria. The tradition was to, if a twin or if a, an infant had uh, passed as, a, as an infant, then a statue, a sculpture was made to honor the passing of that life and it was presented at family gatherings. It was often included at meals to uh, respect the spirit of the person who had uh, transitioned. And this spiritual character is something that's also often carried over into um, some of the uh, uh, early religious practices that were um, by enslaved communities in the barrier island areas of the, of the South Carolina and Georgia Sea Islands. So there are still modern connections to many of these traditional indigenous African uh, ideas that have survived uh, in this digital form in our state, in South Carolina in particular. We also have an extensive collection of photographs 
And um, this is an installation from Harlem on my mind, which was a major exhibition presented in 1969 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Dr. Twiggs acquired these uh, photographic panels uh, from the Schomburg uh, Institute for the Research in African American Studies uh, as part of the New York Public Library, which had uh, inherited them from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the exhibition, when it was first produced in the 1960s, was very controversial because the exhibition centered on new media. It was uh, curated by Alan Scherner, and his idea was to uh, begin to prepare the audiences for the kinds of uh, exhibitions he thought would be a part of the 21st century. And indeed, now it is not uncommon to have exhibitions devoted entirely to photography, to filmmaking, to digital media. And he was uh, somewhat insightful and uh, anticipated this. And the large photographic installation had a kind of um, recorded soundscape, as well as these uh, beautiful images from Harlem, like this one that you see in the central panel by James Vanderzee, a very important um, artist who documented the experiences of Harlem. Also included in that collection, a work such as this photograph of the poet Langston Hughes, and he was just a student at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, an HBCU, showing uh, the young, thoughtful um, Langston Hughes contemplating uh, perhaps his future or the kinds of works he would produce uh, in the literature of the Harlem Renaissance, of which he was a crucial component. So before I introduce our guests, I'd like to offer a disclaimer and the ideas expressed in the program are not the opinions of the administration or officials of South Carolina State University or any of the associated institutions, but are the carefully considered opinions and ideas of our individual expert guests who are distinguished in their respective fields of endeavor. And our panelists are speaking here as private citizens and are not necessarily institutional representatives. Shared history is a project that I think was concluded and presented um, for broadcast in 2005. And um, I was quite fortunate to be a part of this project as, a, as, a, as an advisor, but Vivian Glover was crucial to uh, both identifying the individuals who would do the cinematography and to um, the uh, initial arrangement of the film. We're hoping that Felicia Furman who is the producer, director, and writer of the project and its principal conceptualist, will be able to join us later today. That's uh, an image of Felicia Furman. But we do have in our audience already, or on our panel, news journalist from NBC, uh, producer and author, Vivian Glover, who is a native of Orangeburg, uh, which comes as a surprise to many. She's a prize-winning author. This is her book, The First Fig Tree. So she's not only a journalist um, with the uh, kinds of uh, summaries that we see on the news. She is an author who creates artistic, uh, how could I say it, atmospheres with her beautiful work, The First Fig Tree, which was uh, something I enjoyed reading personally. We used to often sit and talk about certain passages in the book. And it, this, in a way gave uh, Ms. Glover a kind of ideal uh, background to present or to participate in a work like shared history, because shared history is really about the lives of the uh, peoples who survived the, um, the descendants of, of enslavement, who were in interaction with the descendants of those individuals who had actually enslaved them. And in seeing the film, the film was shown here at the Orangeburg County uh, Public Library last Tuesday. And uh, it was free to the public in the amphitheater outside of the library so anyone could come and visit and, and, and view the film. And it was hoped that people would be able to see the film for free and then come to participate in our discussion today. Now, I sent out with the announcements, there was a link that showed the, um, teaser, the sort of uh, preview of the film. And I am going to try and play that before we have our discussion today. But I just wanted to ask Vivian Glover if she would like to come on and uh, to say a few words. 
myself here. Uh, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the discussions here. Um, we did speak about it briefly and um, you wanted, you felt, and I agree with you that there, this, this documentary still had a great deal of re relevance. I think I said to you at the time that I thought perhaps it was even more relevant uh, given how um, Blacks, not only in the United States, but around the world, in Europe, um, many who are also the descendants of enslaved, how they are looking at their past, um, uh, wanting to know more about their ancestors and the role their ancestors played in every level of society. So um, I, I think that this shared history is a wonderful opportunity to have uh, so many discussions on so many levels. Um, one other thing I wanted to say before uh, you go to the, uh, the preview of this is that when I was approached by Felicia Furman um, to participate in this documentary, um, her vision of it was uh, to um, show the relationship, which she thought was respectful and lovely between her descendants, the, those who were the enslavers and the enslaved and those descendants that she, uh, that are still involved with Woodlands Plantation. Um, which is where the documentary took place. She felt that this respect and this love had continued down the lines and she wanted to explore that and she wanted me to be involved in that. So um, initially we came from very different points of view um, with regards to um, how the enslaved and the enslavers saw each other and also their descendants. And I think that um, that's something perhaps people want to think about while they look at the preview that uh, Dr. Martin's going to show you right now. Thank you. So, yes, that's a very important point um, that um, as the film developed, the idea of uh, vantage point became increasingly important. So I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen and show you a quick preview. I think I have couple of images of the plantation at Woodlands. Let's just see if I have it. Yes, this is an old uh, drawing of Woodlands Plantation by T. Addison Richards that showed it, it's showed what it looked like in its original form. However, there was a fire and the plantation was reduced. And this is what remains of Woodlands today. So let me go to this uh, brief. Bonjour. So you've probably already oh, seen my webinar on how to understand to the French, and it would sound Sorry. like that. If you still can't understand the French. on YouTube, so there's no way to see it. Yeah, the baby boy. My family has been connected to this place for over 260 years. 150 of them have been in slavery. My great grandfather was accused of burning this place and left here after the Civil War. Mary Lawson and Sims. He was William Gilmore Sims in Florida. This man is Jim Rump. Did you ever My family you stole the labor of African Americans who worked here during slavery. <laughs> My family stayed on at Woodlands after the Civil War. We've kept up a relationship of sorts with the Sims family since then. This is a centuries old cordial relationship cobbled together by myths of faithfulness and benevolence. 50 years ago, my grandmother brought us together under the ancient oak tree for a December gathering our fathers and brothers had safely 
safely returned from World War II. There were new children and grandchildren to meet. At the turn of this century, we gathered again to commemorate this event and our connected past. We have known each other through the American War of Independence, slavery, the Civil War, segregation, and the Civil Rights Movement. Smiley. After all this time, I wondered if we could talk about our connection through slavery. And one. If we could finally begin Two. to confront the realities Three. of our shared history. Oops. So that gives us an overview of what the film is going to, uh, is concerned with. Um, it is available if you are subscribers to PBS. And I do have uh, the complete DVD here with me. I think there's a full link also on YouTube it's at some point, but the film is about an hour long. So um, my first question for uh, producer uh, Vivian Glover was, it's what about 17 years since that film was made. You know, so it, it doesn't seem like it's that long. And we did a number of projects. We uh, presented it at uh, Spoleto. We did uh, the Animating Democracy Project to talk about uh, these differing experiences from the enslavers and the enslaved. We took it to Spain and it was presented at the Collegium for African-American Research where it got some very surprising and very strong reactions, particularly from the German contingent. So I'm wondering with the distance from the project, uh, having completed it, what do you think that you have learned uh, from the experience and how has distance perhaps changed your perception of the project or has it had any effect? Well, it has certainly changed my perspective and it has had an effect. I didn't realize um, when you first sent me at the email, you said 20 years, which seems I couldn't believe that it had been that long, 17, almost as long. And I thought that was 2005 only a short time before we elected our first African-American president. Right. Three years before. That's right. And then I connect that to Trayvon Martin. And to me, it seems as though through these kinds of tragedies like Trayvon Martin, there has just been us examining what our worth is mm -hmm. um, in the United States. Uh, Felicia said in... Um, the documentary that uh, her family stole the labor and I, it was far more than labor. And I think that that is what um, makes this film relevant now because we can look at what was stolen, um, what was denied, what was suppressed, um, but, and, and what continues to be in those, in those categories and others. So uh, when, when I look at it, um, I, I almost think in some ways we were naive and, and the, the period after doing uh, President Barack Obama's administration, they, have, they brought some realities to us that um, make us go back and look and say, what kind of relationships were those? Um, if the perspective from Felicia's point of view, um, which I respect because that was her effort is that was stolen labor I'm now seeing it as so much more than that, um, so much more than the truth that I was trying to um, elicit from the people who participated in it. So um, I, I think I've reviewed it um, because there's so much to think about given the circumstances that have taken place in this country and elsewhere in the world, Frank. Well, I'm, I'm thinking immediately also of things that have happened, such as the Charleston Nine massacre, um, the changes uh, with the Confederate flag, because um, I think that it had just been moved to the um, position kind of in your face on the Statehouse grounds, just as the, because as, that happened in 2000. 
And then uh, after the Charleston 9, it was finally taken off the state house grounds away from some official place. And now there's this entire discussion about, in a way, I'm not saying eradicating history, but certainly thinking about what do we want to memorialize? And that's been part of what this series has been about is, well, what do we want to um, hold on to in public memory? And how do we want to uh, ass well, assimilate, understand, and discuss that past? And it's, it's a complicated past, but it, it, it's our past, it's our past. So uh, with that in mind, you know, what made it palpable to you? You said you, you felt almost as if you were naive. Because remember, <laughs> it's, I'm gonna get in trouble seeing this. Remember when we talked and I said, when you embarked on this, I said, Vivian, there is no version of the happy darky story that is ever going to work. Do you remember I, I, I gave that warning? <laughs> and I understood just from, with Felicia's good intentions and her desire to delve into something that was so difficult that we had the realities. She had a family. She had family members who were included in the film. Some of them come to terms with things that they probably had not expected to, to deal with. And when you were watching that, you, you watched the trajectory of all of that. So what was it? Was it naive? Tay, was it, that, what was it that motivated you? Was it a hope to reach some sort of communication? And do you think that a film like this offers us any uh, insight into how we could open uh, conversations, open discourse about this difficult past? Okay, that, that's the, a lot of answers and a lot of <laughs> remarks but to that, um, Frank. I think um, the first thing that uh, I want to comment on is that ha having a background in journalism and news, uh, the interview is what the story is always all about. And, um, and even though, um, I heard what you said. I think I felt that I can I can accept that he wants this this um, harmony, but guess what? My my weapon is the interview, <laughs> and at some point in time, that's the story. I mean, it's and as you know, it's as what you capture on tape. So um, I wasn't I wasn't sort of. Um, throwing down the gauntlet early on, but I was aware that there was a lot of potential um, in it, but it, it had to be brought out. So I don't, I don't know that um, I was not naive as much as appreciating what it was that she was trying to do. But and I, I'm gonna keep going back to this um, because I, as, as so many people who are looking at the situation today, um, you, you keep delving back into the past to, to kind of uh, understand and reconcile. When I looked at that, when I think about that documentary now, when I l just listened to that little preview, Felicia could name all of her ancestors. She wanted their illustrious um, contributions and whatever to be a part. She claimed that as a part of, of who she was. That was in there always, even when the plantation became just a modest dwelling compared to what it was originally. There is still claiming this heritage and this birthright and, and you know, this image of who they were in the South and elsewhere else. But the people that she wanted to love who they were had, had nothing. They mm. had no identities except through their records who they were as the, as, as the enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even as, the, as we may discuss later on, it turned out that what little they claimed and, and got th through honestly was they, they weren't even given credit for that. Um, it, it was it, the idea was that we, we loved them, they were devoted to us, they were beloved, but they had no identity and I think that's why I still see a relevance and that's why I still think about it because all, all the Manigos knew about themselves was that they had been purchased mm -hmm. after the rice plantations had been invaded by the Union armies. That's all they knew that they had walked barefoot from the sea the sea islands up to Bamberg County where they were purchased. 
-hmm. as, as the planners moved on up into Greenville. That's, that's a sum total of their history. So I didn't see that then as much as I do now, nor did I understand the impact of it. But I think, as I say, given what, how we're looking at history now, the 1619 project, the half that's never been told, these books that have put these scholarly uh, uh, journals that have come out um, with people with incredible credentials to discuss this. It, looking at shared history again, you, there's more that I see and there's more that I think can be discussed. Well, I was thinking in particular, um, and I'm not gonna show the, uh, the incident from the film, but Carl Buck who was Felicia's uncle, I believe, and Dorothy Manigo had a discussion um, about the acquisition of the property on which she was living. And there had been a kind of mistake passed on in um, the Sims family, which is William Gilmore Sims is Felicia's ancestor. And Mr. Buck is a descendant from William Gilmore Sims that the um, enslavers had benevolently donated 80 acres of property to the people who formerly lived on the land. And the truth was, not only had it not been donated, that the enslaved peoples, once they were freed, had purchased that property, and the purchase had been disguised. Um, we don't know why. We don't know why. In terms of the um, Sims family, perhaps not wanting people to know they were passing property on to African Americans or not wanting to let people know they needed the money. Again, this is why I invited Felicia to be in the conversation. She may have had opportunities to find more information. But the, uh, the point you made about not seeing the African-American uh, uh, participants in the creation of their wealth as individuals is the thing that is now very striking, is the thing that is part of the discussion that people do need to have in order to understand exactly how we are where we are. Exactly. Uh, again, I wish her voice were here uh, to um, fill in on her own what she says in the film about how she perceived the uh, peoples who were no longer enslaved but were retainers, who were not being paid very well, um, who were writing to try and get social security while the records would, dis would uh, portray that they had hardly been given any money, nothing was paid into social security, so they would be left in destitute situations. And that's being seen in some instances almost by the, um, their deniers, the people who would not pay them as a, almost like a badge of honor that they just never asked for anything, which was, again, that was a shock to me. That was, so when we're trying to forge these discussions as a journalist, as someone who has covered the news, who has uh, made a living from looking at these difficult situations where miscommunications occur between people and that, you know, that is what makes the news so often. What do you think would be an approach, especially for people in the South who have these um, records where we know in instances and, and naturally part of the discussion will end up in reparations. What would be an approach to reconciling these difficulties which are continuing to create inequities. And I, and I will come back to young um, Aquarius, uh, who was, uh, yeah, the speakers in the film. What, what, what do you think can be done? Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the term genteel poverty. Mm. And what, how does that fit into it? I think it has to do, it was what people held on to. Um, that was their identity once the civil war was over. Um, their wealth was not only b based on the, the, um, the labor uh, and the ability to sell and trade the enslaved, but th their, their identity was as well, Frank. Um, th that was, it, it was the same as whether you had a beautiful thoroughbred horse or whatever. Uh, the enslaved were a part of that. Um, and so I think the difficulty that families like Felicia had um, maybe what some more prosperous and some less was that this was no long this was no more mm -hmm. so how, how do you hold on to that i mean some people decided to dominate you got the clan you have uh, jim crow laws you had all kinds of ways to 
to to dominate to give yourself some kind of identity as to who who you were and who that that the others were the others being the enslaved or the former enslaved and then you had people perhaps like the descendants of the sims who uh, who didn't want to have that outward appearance of of um you know dis deciding that they're going to oppress openly oppress and I think so there maybe their outlet and Felicia's not here to say this, but these are things I've thought about myself because this is the what the Felicia tried to do with shared history. That's just growing as far as I'm concerned with the dialogues that are taking place in the books that are coming out. For them, they wanted to maintain their civility, that that genteel air, that being the gentlemen and the ladies, perhaps. But you still needed that black labor to do that. You couldn't be hanging your washing on the line and saying you're a descendant of the Sims, of William Gilmore Sims. But if you didn't have the funds to do it, um, or you, uh, you could perhaps convince yourself that these people were prepared to do it for you uh, mm. because they loved you so much, or they cared about you so much, or they had some affiliation with the land. So. Um, I, I have a feeling that there's some of that that takes place when you get people who feel they've got special relationships um, with with uh, the, the, the descendants of the enslaved, but only they define it. Um, yeah. It's not. It's not that that until um, and her name just slipped me. Just slipped, uh, architect from New York. Oh, Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, Rhonda. 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 Mm -hmm. Until Rhonda actually was more blunt about her mother's role in the household, I don't think they considered the fact that they were ex still exploiting. Um, right. And they were doing that in order to have someone drive them into town um, who wasn't really being paid anything to drive them into town or who did their washing or came and helped out when they had special events. I think that was the, that was, they, that was what they were holding onto. That was their heritage. That's who they saw themselves as descendants. Um, so, and and to, to that extent, the Manigos and others were brought into that role without really having um, much say in the relationship that they had at Woodland Plantation. Well, you're, you're speaking of the incident that's mentioned in the film with uh, the um, grandmother, I think, of uh, Rhonda Kears, who Felicia knew as Mud. Miss Mudd, um, who spent more time with Felicia's family than she did with her own grandchildren. And that was pointed out. And Rhonda wonders in the film, well, could Felicia have known her grandmother better than she had? But of course, Felicia would always only have known that part of the grandmother that was presented publicly to them because she was, uh, and she was an employee. And that is, um, I guess, part of the, the fallacy of the thinking that leads to so much misunderstanding where um, silence is uh, accepted as either complicity or acceptance, when that just was not the case. Uh, and we saw that especially with Dorothy Manigo, who was adamant about <laughs> clarifying about the situation with the acquisition of the deed for the property they lived on. So with these complications and the and for lack of a better term, the misdirection that is almost inevitably a part of this kind of engagement. I'm wondering how can a new language be forged that uh, will allow people to go forward without bitterness, without, I, I, you can't control anyone's emotions, some people will probably be bitter. But what in your opinion as a journalist, as someone who's you know, objectively assessed situations, what is it that America needs to be doing to begin to repair the damage that we have the evidence of? And this film is part of that evidence, really. It is. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna sound more like a journalist than I, than I want to, but I, I think right now with the reaction um, mm -hmm. against um, the 1690, um, I, I'm sorry, the name of, what this is termed as just slipped my mind, but the idea um, that you would bring into classrooms, okay, uh, bring in the critical race theory. Thank you, Frank. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
that the the objections to that, which are on every level from the Board of Education right on up to our national um, our national elected officials, um, I don't know that I don't know if there's an answer to that right now in terms of across the United States. I think that it's too controversial um, because it's been made to be controversial. Mm -hmm. But what I do think, and this is, um, I think that the two things that we can, we can consider going forward. One is um, for us Blacks, us descendants of the enslaved, to learn as much as we can about our ancestors. And so, for some, that's easier than others. But the, the, the basis of it is just to know and I think we may have to say this to ourselves over and over again, we built this country. Mm -hmm. It is our wealth, it is our label, it is our, our skills that did this. So however it's documented, how fragmented it's doc how fragment the documentation is, even that is enough to say that that's what my ancestors did. Whether right. it was picking cotton or whether they were a skilled seamstress or whether they knew everything about horses or whatever, that, that what this country became was generated. We were the wealth. We were what made this country what it was. And that gives us a basis and also means um, accepting that may lessen any resentment or bitterness because it's a fact. It's, well, it's a fact. What you're suggesting is a paradigm shift. Because yeah, what exists, yeah, what exists is people feel, and I'll never forget Aquarius Rowe, who's a very young man in the film, you no, know, 17 years ago, I guess he must be in his 30s by now. But um, in the making of the film, he has a reminiscence about his enslaved ancestor. And he says, well, he was a slave, but he was a good person. And yeah, that's, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so many people think in that way as if, in some way, the, those who were enslaved were at fault. They were coerced, they were beaten, they were tortured, um, they were sometimes starved. There was, there was coercion being used to force people into this condition of slavery. And then when they were no longer legally enslaved, you had the Ku Klux Klan and the Knight Riders and all these other forms of intimidation, the predecessors to what you saw on January 6th. So this is why it's so important for young people to be vigilant, to understand just what you said, that, um, People who were enslaved and were brought from Africa were usually uh, kidnapped and captured because of gifts, because of either knowledge of how to do sluices and ditches for rice cultivation, or the knowledge they had about growing cotton, or knowledge they had about blacksmithing. Or So people were being brought here because of knowledge, not as dumb labor, but as people who had these contributions to make, and those contributions were stolen, they were taken away. So now there is a need to create conversations about greater equity. And that is part of the tension that I think we're, it's, a, it's a growing pain that we're feeling in the country, we're feeling all over the country. And what you were saying about CRT is interesting. Yesterday, we had a conversation with a young woman, um, Kizzy Staley Gibson, who you know the Staley's, the artist who yeah. is in the mm -hmm. community. That's their daughter, and she's running for state superintendent of education as a conservative Republican woman. And she made the point, uh, she was saying uh, critical race theory is not something that's actually being taught in the schools. It's not allowed in the South Carolina schools. And critical race theory really is a legal formulation developed at Harvard by, um, I can't remember Bell's first name, and uh, Kimberly Kintra Crenshaw, and a number of other scholars of legal documents and legal arguments who talk about the real world impact of racial identity. Um, Derek Bell, thank you, Elizabeth Robeson. I, I wanna bring Elizabeth into the conversation uh, because I know she has, she has some thoughts about this because of her similarity to some aspects of this history. Um, but the point is that this uh, study is about the real world impacts of racialized uh, experience um, 
not about this oppressive um, trying to make someone feel bad because of their color or lack of color or you know, their experience of having a, or not producing melanin. That's not the point. And so it's a straw man argument. It's, it's, it's just a dark horse straw man argument to distract people from going forward. Elizabeth, let me introduce Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is an historian. Do you want to come into the conversation, Elizabeth? And, and uh, make Sure, I, I, I would. I, I don't want to say too much, but I, I would like to say a few things. Um, that, camera, Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Camera. That back up. Um, Vivian, Vivian, I love your book. I bought it years and years ago. Um, <laughs> I'm also from Orangeburg. But what I wanted to say is when I watched the film last week, my back was immediately up. I think Felicia, and I'm a graduate of Furman, so I, I know something about Richard Furman, and I know a lot about Sims. I feel like Felicia, Felicia was trying to square a circle. She's very well-intentioned, but as Carter G. Woodson said, good intentions are not enough. I mean, I don't understand this attempt to portray my ancestors as benevolent. I mean, her use of the word benevolent is just outrageous. And I, and I, I find it sort of significant. And that's the key word that says to me that she's trying to bridge something that just really can't be bridged. Behind all that culture of manners and the way her, her family behaves in those social situations with the descendants of the black families, you know, they're just so stiff and insincere, but behind all that, all those manners, there is just unbelievable brutality. You know, this, all of this, oh, how are you? And all this crap is just a mask for brutality and it's a form of denial. That, that's what I got out of the film. I got angry about it. And I shared it with some white male friends who do believe that they're, you know, progressive minded and whatnot. And they think Felicia is a hero. So on that level, I guess, you know, it sort of speaks to this uh, incremental consciousness among white people, but they've got so far to go. I mean, because the indoctrination to the mythos of the lost cause, of course, I was one of those children. Scarlett O'Hara was my, my heroine. Robert E. Lee was my hero. Every summer I read Gone with the Wind. And it wasn't until somehow in the summer of the seventh grade, I got a hold of um, Ellie Wiesel's Night. And all of a sudden this click went, you know, this light bulb went off mm -hmm. that, wait a minute, you know, because I'm also involved in desegregation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was just all very, I, it, it was a, like a, you know, Helen Keller moment at the well where, okay, wait a minute, something is not, things are not consistent, you know? so. I, I just really applaud the work you did on this. And it, I think it's a shame that we have to tiptoe around white people's um, feelings when they've got nothing to be, uh, you know, nobody needs to hold them, you know, preciously. Hmm. That's how, and then there's Strom. Did y'all catch Strom there? There were fleeting moments of Strom in some of the home movies. He's standing underneath the Confederate flag that's flying. It looks like it's on the house. And he's there with the grandmother who wrote those outrageous histories. Books. I mean, you know, so it's, surely Strom is representative of the brutality. He's on the front lines while back at home, all the women are, you know, being protected from, you know, the workings of their men. And like that J.D. Coleman that is the man who facilitated the purchase of the property. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on, you know, a project that relates to um, the lynching of the Lohman family in Aiken. So I was going through uh, Cole Please's papers the other day, and I've got stuff from J.D. Coleman. And, you know, it's like white men were at work every damn day mm -hmm. to make sure that oppression was not letting up not even one inch. Has that, you know what I'm saying? Has I, I'm not sure that's changed. Um, <laughs> no, it hasn't. It hasn't. But I'm saying there was, but there's still at home. I think white women were somehow really kept in. I'm not saying they were ignorant. They certainly weren't. But they were allowed to live this other make-believe fantasy life with all their black servants. 
It, it's just so bizarre and sick. I, I think they were just as aware. Uh, certainly, I got that impression with um, Felicia's mother. I, I want to make one little point that occurred to me earlier. J.D. Copeland is the man who purchased that land right. from the... Um, the, the, the uh, right. Yes. Just by chance, and I'm out doing some journalist work, his, I think it's his grandson. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's his son, but either that, he works for um, the NBC News Channel in Charlotte. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's the that's the, the hub where all the news from all over the world is fed into this channel and then dispersed out to the network and everybody else. And I was there working on a story. I don't remember what it was, but obviously something that was breaking news. I don't know how we understood each other. I don't know how I got to know who he was. I don't remember um, Copeland. I might've just mentioned that, but he, he told me what happened um, with his ancestor purchasing that land. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, um, they wanted to buy it. He said, but the, the Sims would not be seen giving land selling land they knew they sold that land frank mm -hmm. they wouldn't be seen selling land to blacks because that was helping them to advance mm -hmm. so they didn't want to do it so copeland stepped in mm -hmm. and purchased that land from the, the sims family and then dorothy's family paid for it in increments right so and there were a few acres then a few acres then a few acres so Everybody knew the truth behind that. And yet Felicia's mother would say, oh, we gave them that mm -hmm. land. That was never a part of the myth. Uh, I mean, they had many, but that was never one that for some reason they could believe or talk about. So um, I don't think those women were delicate or genteel at all. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were motivators um, in some instances. What what was going on, but I want to get back and um, perhaps um, Ms. Thompson will say something about this. I really do think that the dialogue that took place between the, the descendants of um, Woodland Plantation, much of which wasn't, was not included in the documentary, mm -hmm. um, to my, my chagrin, I had the pieces, the, the pieces that were in there, I really had to fight for, mm -hmm. um, but there was real dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's the way to go forward. Not when, not groups that come together for that purpose, but just when people see there's an opportunity to want to know more about both sides. Right. When they just, I just think, because that's the only way when you're sitting there and you, you're talking to another human being who's had whatever experiences they've had because of this country's history of slavery. And you want to know more and hear more from them and offer more, mm -hmm. I, I think that that can still happen despite the resistance that's taking place um, politically um, right now. What's going to help that is the fact that the Caribbean is doing the same thing. They're saying, Who, who's the queen to us? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, they made sure that these, uh, these investment groups brought in uh, as slaves and sometimes treated far more brutal than we were. So there's a, an awakening that's taking place and that's not gonna go away. And I think people are going to have these conversations um, as more, and it's, it's gonna be a bit like when we discovered we could find our ancestors from DNA. You know, at the beginning it was really elementary, but now almost every day they can tell you something more about your DNA. And I think that's what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm when we have conversations about being the descendants of well, the enslaved. Omari Fox has a question in the chat. Omari, do you want to come on and, and ask your question and let Ms. Glover respond? And Elizabeth, if you can stay in to respond. Omari. Hi, Vivian, always great to see you. Same here. Um, I just, I'll just summarize. Um, I just find it interesting that the black folks have to relieve the financial misgivings of the people. Um, we have to always be the dignified people, the better than um, 
every time there's some kind of political unrest. I don't agree with protesting recklessly, but before anything happens, it always has to be peaceful. And there's all these boxes and requirements and nuances that you have to observe and, and learn and navigate in order to survive. And to me, it's just like, you know, the wolf asking, you know, the animals that is chasing, like going up to the to the animals that is, you know, taking back to its cave and destroying or eating or whatever it's doing, saying, hey, is are you good with me, you know, attacking you and, and getting away with it? It's just, I, I just can't yeah. reconcile that mentality of, well, we, we want partial forgiveness. Now, we're not going to atone for anything, but we just want the verbal, you know, just don't be mad at us while we still kind of destroy you. And um, just for me and my evolution of humanity, which which I had a lot of conversations um, when, it, when this film first came out, um, I had to learn to not use white people as a reference point for my humanity. And... Um, oh. It wasn't hard for me to do. I had a lot of mentorship and a strong family, but just just what are your thoughts about how we always have to be better than our oppressors all the time? And then we don't have a right to feel upset about what's been done to us. Well, Omar, it's good to see you too. And I hope that what you just said turns into one of your poems because um, I, I I just wanted to hear it. Um, I want to go back to what Felicia said about they stole our labor, but that's not, the reason I said there was more than that is because you're bringing that point up. That's what they've stolen too. Your our ability to be seen as rightfully protesting, as not, as not wanting to be the lamb being taken off to by the wolf. Mm -hmm. That that part of what when I say it was more than the labor that was stolen. That's, that's been stolen as well. So that's a conversation to have. How, how do we consider that? And I, so I think what you've done is given us another talking point. How do we, how do we consider that? I read an article today, um, briefly scanning about this uh, shooting in Michigan where this uh, policeman Mm -hmm. shot a young man uh on, he was on his back and shot him in the head mm -hmm. and um i always read the comment sections and people were saying well if he hadn't run away well mm -hmm. if he hadn't had the wrong tags on his car he would still be alive and it's the same thing like he was supposed to be the he's supposed to be the i said you said wolf i said lamb, lamb is the other part of it he was supposed to be the person not causing a policeman to shoot him in the back of his head for for what so that's part of what's stolen as well just the the right to to, to stand up for yourself and not feel threatened your life threatened um to protest because of something that um that you feel is unjust it's always it's questioned so i think we need to think about that and uh, as I said, and I, and I didn't say it playfully, uh, I think that I, I would love to hear how you express that poetically and, sh and share it um, so that others think about it and want to discuss it. Well, I'm going to jump in with this comment um, about what um, Elizabeth alluded to was the willful blindness. So it is probably true that people were aware of the um, falsity of the myth, but in telling ourselves myths, we often are trying to ease our own conscience about you know day to day experience, and we are we're trying to move forward. And Omari has also pointed out this um, uh, predisposition that you know why is it always the uh, African American individual who's expected to forgive and to be the voice of reason and to uh, be the person alert, as as you just said, Vivian, that. Um, the young man is being blamed for the incompetence of the police officer who laid him down on the ground and shot him in the back of the head. And I think it's important for people to understand there is an onus on us as people who have the rights of citizenship to observe those rights and to use them. That's why the series is called On Being a Citizen. You do need to be aware of your rights as a citizen. 
Uh, and yeah, you are supposed to have the proper papers to document that you are authorized to drive a vehicle and to have insurance and do all those things. But if you don't have those things, that is not an authorization for someone to kill you. And that's what we have to understand. So you do have the obligation to observe the rules and laws. Um, but if you are making, if there's an infraction of the laws, there are still remedies and rules that you have to follow in order to be safe and you should be safe. Now, when you're not safe, then that looks like that is the onus being placed on law enforcement. And we have to partner with law enforcement people. And I know that some people think, that, well, that's ridiculous. You can't partner with law enforcement. It's antagonistic to your very existence. Sometimes the people involved are corrupt. And all of that may be true, but you still must enter into those situations with the expectation of an appropriate outcome. And that's how I was always trained. And um, so far, I've been really rewarded most of the time in that expectation. So as a citizen, there is an onus on us to be both civil and civic minded. However, you can protest with great power and remain civil. Um, and having these conversations, this is why I asked the question about how can we forge the language? Because if people become so angry that they really become impotent and ineffectual in their ability to protest, then they're not doing themselves a service. They're not doing a proper service to the future generations who must benefit from um, their ability to address the issues as the generations in the past have benefited us. I mean, that's why people were marching. That's why people were doing a peaceful, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, uh, nonviolent demonstrations because they knew that violent demonstrations would just escalate and would not result in the outcome that was desirable. So how do we develop ongoing strategies to educate young people in what they need to know as citizens and to help them understand these injustices of the past, but not live through them again. That's, that's the, the complication. I guess you could say, start bringing civic studies back into classrooms again. That's true. Um, do, do people really, I mean, do we, we understand what citizenship is? I know that sounds, um, like That's a true. simple answer, but um, it's, it's, I, I don't think we can understand what happened on January 6th if we don't understand how misrepresented citizenship is um, in this country if people think that's, if that's, if that's what it is. And I'm, I'm using them because I don't think there was any protest less civil that's and less productive <laughs> if we want to use these things, um, then, then that. So perhaps it's, it's an idea of understanding what your responsibilities are and what the responsibilities are of the citizenry as a collective. But again, I, I go back to thinking um, it's, it's going to be one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I say that to Amari um, as well. Uh, if, if, if there is an opportunity for someone who's really interested in your humanity to give you the opportunity to be really interested in theirs. And I did, I did try that um, with, I shouldn't say I tried it. I think perhaps we did succeed. And I believe I understood how, why she had to hold on to what I consider myths. Mm -hmm. um, that to take that away was, well, what, well, what, to just, what is left? Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, I think I think that's why Donald Trump could become president because the people were being told you won't have anything left, you won't be anything mm -hmm. um, as these as the minority becomes the majority. Um, you, you know, but then you have to say, well, do they know who they are now? Um, in order for someone to say they're, they're going to take that away, but so the only way. I think the only way forward, Frank, and you said being civil, I think that that's very much a part of it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
um, so that someone, you give someone the opportunity to see you not as the other, but as someone that's not, that's not threatening, even if you feel that they feel threatened by you. And even if they are threatening you, um, I, I think that goes back. I think we know that lesson better than anybody. We descendants, because we had to, we had to live with that. I think we have the tools and the experience. Uh, I think it's, it's in us. Uh, to, to be able to do that. Um, it, it's just that we have to give it some thought and realize that perhaps that is the reaction, especially with what we're going through right now, because this is, in my opinion, as a journalist, mm -hmm. what we're seeing right now is going to escalate. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, it's, it's not going to, I don't see any, I don't hear any voices out there trying to say that this is not the way forward or saying or predicting where this is going. I don't hear this on, from any, anybody who has a voice of a leader understanding where, what this country, where this country is taking itself. So, well, but yeah, you just said it. So escalation, we know what escalation is always going to lead to. Escalation is going to lead to what we're seeing in Ukraine. So that's when, when no one tries to reason you know, you lose your words, and then people turn to some sort of violent action. And so that's why it's so crucial to, as you pointed out, to teach civics in schools, to not have it ex ex excluded from the curriculum, to have these conversations on citizenship, and to articulate first to conceptualize the things that are happening to us, the things that happened in the past, the things that are happening around us now, to adequately conceptualize those things, articulate them, and address them with our ideas, as opposed to have people just default to these random actions. Because what you just said is a crucial thing. What was more useless than this attack on the Capitol to try and stop an appropriate um, action of democracy because people were angry with the outcome? It was an illegal act, and that's why the people are being arrested, because it was an illegal act. Do they understand the, the character of what they did? Is there a discourse to open that up so that it can be understood? The politicians, many of them, are encouraging it. And that is why Americans need to talk to each other. People need to be clear on what a citizen is supposed to do and what a citizen should be. And that temper tantrum had by these angry people who just felt that they weren't getting enough of something, that was wrong, that was just wrong. And Elizabeth made a comment uh, in, in the chat. I, I wish that, I'm so sorry that Felicia's not here so that we could hear her voice. Yes. Um, she, she did position herself as someone who was trying, I don't know that she did succeed, she did position herself as someone who's trying to um, bring herself out of those myths. To, to, she moved to Colorado as a way to try and escape. Now, the thing about changing sites um, that can change our opinions, it can change our outlook, it can change our understanding, but wherever we go, we're always gonna be there. <laughs> so that always ends up as something where we have to um, work on ourselves. Omari has his hand raised. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just had some some thoughts from that last thread. Um, well, first, I'm in an uh, interesting place now in my career because I work around a lot of police and community relationships. And what started me on the road to that was I was on a panel at USC, and I was supposed to be the angry black guy. They put me next to a uh, white deputy. I was supposed to be the angry Black Lives Matter guy, uh, some kind of prosecutor and another person. So they specifically positioned me next to the police so we could have some kind of, you know, discord. And um, I was 42 at the time. So it was the first time I was in a conversation with police in, in any capacity other than being stopped and maybe a couple of basketball players, you know, from the back b-ball court. And um, so I said my spiel, I actually said it in, in poetic form when they went one by one in our intros and I kind of talked about a Trayvon Martin narrative that I had. 
and then when it got to the officer um but i did say that i was i was still teaching at the time when it got to the officer he drew this parallel of me being a public servant as a teacher and having to negotiate all these things in the classroom and my income being generated you know it was known as a title one school i was still there as a servant no matter how much poverty was there i was still a public servant you know to those students and families and he drew a parallel between um, police being in the public servant role. And I never heard of an officer articulate from that point of like what their actual job was. And then I started thinking about, well, what is the police actual job? And they often get in these kind of catch all situations that don't have anything to do with what they're trained for or their function and so on and so forth. And from that one dignified interaction um conversations that happened since then like have happened but i probably would have been very rigid or oh, i'm a black man under no circumstances do i talk to the police even though i'm no hustler or no criminal or anything like that it's not a matter of street code it's just black male code that you just don't have any interaction um, with the police mm-hmm. and um that's been part of my my evolution and I was falling back to the, the conversation we had around on um, the rebel flag. And I, and I know you kind of alluded to the real reason why the flag came down. And I, I can't remember how you framed it. Um, to something to the effect of it was out of um, a personal relationship with a black person that they had that was a colleague in the legislature. It wasn't about how how black people were feeling and you know the traumaticness killing nine people it was about like oh well, i knew that one black person so i had it so it became personal and i can't i don't know if you want to try to rearticulate the way you said it um, no I, I said specifically it was due to the murder of clemente pinkney who served in the legislature and he had a personal relationship with so many people there and it was that injustice of his murder that caused the flag to be allowed to come down and there were people who still wanted to keep it up but um, I can't remember the name of the young woman who was uh, the legislator, I think, from Charleston County, perhaps, and she was the, the very powerful voice. I could find her name out later. But she was literally crying. She was screaming um, at the legislature because of the emotional impact of their colleague having been murdered by someone flying that Confederate flag. And that is when the flag came down. That was the reason why. It was also because of the heinous nature of what uh, um, Dylan Lee did in a church where he had prayed with the people and been fed and welcomed. And even he said, oh, you were so nice to me, I almost didn't want to kill you. So that showed his sickness. It showed the sickness of racism. And it showed what kinds of conversations need to be had that aren't being had because they are, they remain uncomfortable conversations. Which is why I'm saying there has to be a new language forged in order for our community to move forward. That's, so the next film in our series is going to be Meltdown in Dixie because Meltdown in Dixie is about Confederate flag just flying here in Orangeburg still. Um, and there, I think, is now a lawsuit between the sons of Confederate veterans and um, maybe the city council who are trying to get that flag down. Is it that the flag needs to come down or is it that the hearts and minds of the people really need deeper consideration for their neighbors? Which of those things is the stronger weight and how can you open that conversation to live in community together? That's how I see that problem, not just about a flag, which you know is a symbol, it could fly, it could not fly, why is it flying? What is your intention in flying? Are you trying to fly the flag to hurt other people? That's what needs to be addressed. That's what needs to be discussed. That would need that that is what needs to be um, confronted, not necessarily in a negative way, but in an honest way. And if we follow the logic, usually people will decide, well, okay. But it, in the South, we often need an emotional catalyst. And the murder of Clemente Pinckney was that emotional catalyst for the removal of the flag in your face on the state house grounds because some people were indeed flying that to um, show a kind of defiance, to show we are proud of 
our Confederate past. We are proud of these decisions made by forebears. No one's really investigated, well, exactly what are you proud of? Well, we're proud of states' rights. Well, that's not what the war was about. The war is about enslaving other people. The war is about humiliation. The war is about denying access to freedom. Um, Elizabeth, you had something? You're un unmute. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, are you suggesting that if Clementi, Clementa Pinckney had not been a member of the legislature, or hadn't been killed, it had just been uh, nine people, nobody in the state house, that the flag might not have come down. Is that what you're saying? I really feel yeah. that um, it's quite possible it would not have come down. I, I agree with you. And I just want to make sure that I understood what you, yeah. the implications were. Well, it was that personal relationship. It was, it's mm -hmm. knowing someone impacted directly by a racist act and the egregious character of how that was conducted. That's what caused that to come down. That's how closely we in the South, and I'm a Southerner, Vivian's a Southerner, you're a Southerner, Omari's from the North, but that is how closely, I guess Omari has Southern roots, but he's uh, not born in, in South Carolina. That's how- Carpet bagger. Say again, your carpet bagger, yes. But that's how people hold on to identity. And these discourses are about identity. They're about how we tell ourselves a story about who we think we are. Can I just throw in uh, that's something about that, that, that Emmanuel 9, because I covered that, mm -hmm. um, which I think was, uh, that was the worst. And I've covered stories where more people um, have lost their lives. But um, what that allowed Elizabeth to happen was that debate that you saw um, take place. The initial response um, with, I um, can't think of her name, the governor. Um, Haley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Haley. Um, what's her, let's, okay. The initial reaction to that, Nikki Haley, was to push, put that to the side because they really felt um, that that would, that, that would be, uh, to a motive an issue, it would um, the Republicans would be weakened by it. Um, let's just uh, the 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 um, their their conversation was let's just focus on the tragedy of this. Let's leave the flag out of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the side. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to um, we're not going to discuss this right now. And, and almost like it almost has nothing to do with the flag. The reason it got to that point when you saw those emotional arguments that were live was because the pressure by the business communities on this to say this, you know, we, we that's not how South Carolina is going to be known um, that somebody can do this. That's not, we're trying to get, we're trying to be the new South and okay, this, the, the, the issue was brought to the fore, the flag has to come down. So, because it's a, it's a, it's our reputation, our commercial interests are online right now, and that's why this the good governor. Mm -hmm. um, but she's a politician, and 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 that's most politicians are about survival. So that was why it was a done deal before all that took place that that flag would come down. But what it did was give us a sense of history. Mm -hmm. of how of how it, it played but it was already I, there wouldn't have been any debate if they thought they weren't gonna they weren't going to be successful in 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 doing that they knew that the time had come that they couldn't any longer keep this balance going you know that flag which never really flew because it was so heavy in front of the capitol building it weighed a ton you rarely rarely seeing it move mm -hmm. stir um that's why that happened. It was just, it was just pressure. Um, and I say that because for, for, for the governor's office to take credit for that is something that bothers me because oh, it, that's, okay. that's, that's not history. It really was. It, that was the reason it was, it was brought down. It, it was untenable. It, it could no longer fly up there when this man had made that the reason for the slaughter of uh, so, someone that everybody very much cared about and respected in 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 that chamber uh, um amari where people did have those kinds of conversations whatever their political uh
of leanings were they knew each other as human beings and they respected each other because they have had those honest one-on-ones um and and so um th those passionate feelings were really there because he was loved um and and respected by people who knew knew his goodness well that what we saw was absolutely genuine um but it was a foregone conclusion that that they that the the vote would be to bring the flag down and Dean Slade has entered another aspect of the conversation. He's asking about a definition of citizenship of where, because citizenship itself, he's saying, is a kind of um, division, uh, assuming that someone is a citizen of a particular nation, that nation has certain borders, and within that uh, particular nation, certain people have access to certain rights and privileges. Um, that sounds like a broader conversation for a later time, because we have about five more minutes. Uh, Elizabeth, you were about to say something. I was just going to just follow up, and that's it. I'll say, if you go back and read Nikki Haley's statement, you know, when she's making the announcement that the flag is going to come down, mm -hmm. that statement is such a valorization of the honor of the flag and what it stood for. Go back and read what she said. I remember. There is just a very, like a little throw away something to uh you know the dark side of the flag it's all about honor and glory and heritage and you know that it's a laudable our history is laudable that's basically what she's saying and i so she's yeah she's absolutely awful that's all and that comes from somebody I have a question who, for you. Uh, go ahead. so i get this question a lot um from my friends of european descent um how would you advise white folks to navigate this conversation? Hmm. Can you advise people who are constructing identities <laughs> as white to navigate this conversation? I don't know if that's a fair question, personally. Yeah. Anybody want to deal with that? I, I don't know that we, it's, it's a how, it's not a step by step guide. Um, I think the question to throw back at them is, it, I, I was thinking of Jack Nicholson and whatever movie saying you can't handle the truth that line that um, goes. But it's the idea that um, do you want to? Is, are you, is this a is this a legitimate question or is it a challenging question or is it a question to um, that gives me a platform to defend something or whatever? Do you honestly do you honestly want to have a dialogue? And if you do. Um, if you want to have a dialogue, then that, that's possible. So you have to, I ask them to question why you're asking this question of me and tell me what it is um, that's behind it and what it is that you hope it will achieve for both of us, for you and for me. And then perhaps you can go forward um, with that. But no, there's no... There's no idiots. What is it? The, the, those books for dummies. I'm not being a racist. The dummies guide to not being a racist. <laughs> what is that? I don't I don't um, not being a racist for dummies. Yes. Yeah, not being a racist for dummies. <laughs> I'll laugh if only there was. But anyway. Um, it's something someone could try to write. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I mean, well, think about human beings and xenophobia, and um, this is a very fundamental human fear of what is unfamiliar. So uh, I don't think it's so much just about race as it is just dealing with unfamiliarity. And there's a powerful aesthetic uh, component to all, all racist arguments. Um, I mean, you can construct an identity as a human being first, and then secondarily, you know, you could think about what you look like and what your gender is and what, you know, your sex is. Um, and I separated those two because we know that's another ongoing debate and all these other social constructions in your class and your education. There are all these things that divide us and that, that goes back to Dean's question. It was raised about well, what is a citizen and is a citizen another kind of division? And in the political world in which we live now, our citizenship, because when we travel, we have passports and we're on those passports uh, backed up by a myth of identity connected to a particular landmass. Um, so those are all social constructs, some of them a little bit beyond our kin for this conversation. 
but um, if you're teaching people about citizenship, about responsibility, about civic mindedness, what should we be learning is a, an open question. It's an open question. And as a journalist, you're having to, you've had to make lots of decisions about how far must I go in dealing with the story? How many questions, um, or what kind of question is too intrusive? When am I invading someone's privacy? So you've had to deal with the moral issues of, of um, investigation, I'll say it like that. And this, to some extent, falls into that area when a person's investigating him or herself, um, their liabilities, because they're things we won't, we're not going to want to admit. So we've actually hit our time. Uh, let's see, there's, uh, I think Dean just put something else. Dean, do you want to come on and say anything? You noted here that Boris Johnson announced his intention to fly people in the UK. You wanted to change the conversation about Partygate. That, that, that's yesterday's news. If I could be a journalist, um, that came out yesterday. Um, that's another interesting conversation for sure. Um, but I, I do think that um, the question about citizenship is one that I think that's a very good conversation to have going forward. And there may be common ground. And that's what we should always look for. So I've enjoyed this. Oh. Thank you so much for, for being here. <laughs> I wish, again, we could have heard Felicia's voice. Uh, I miss her being here. I'm not sure exactly what happened. She did have, as I said, oral surgery, and she may have had um, some difficulty speaking. She, she did let me know that that was a possibility. But thank you so much um, for our conversation and for being in our series on being a citizen. And let me see if I can close out our program with the PowerPoint here, let's see. Oh, these are the, um, you mentioned Rhonda Kearse and Charles Orr. The, these are the people who uh, narrated parts of the film or were um, important. We mentioned Dorothy Manigo, and I spoke of um, both George Rowe and Aquarius Rowe who remembered their ancestors, their ancestors, they were descendants of George Rowe. And we talked about the, um, the challenges of, of uh, thinking about ancestors who were enslaved, as opposed to the narrative that, that came down from Felicia's line where people seem to have a kind of pride around being perceived as these Southern aristocrats, when in fact, that's something that might now be understood to be somewhat problematic. And as part of this uh, on being a citizen's uh, series, you've talked about memorials and monuments. This is, of course, the African American Memorial in Columbia. And we had looked at how this memorial itself, in a way, denies history because nowhere on this memorial is any particular American of African descent named. It is a generic memorial to the contributions of Americans of African descent as a group without citing the. Um, the works of particular individuals, although it shows people like Justice Finney, um, Dizzy Gillespie, Althea Gibson, Ron McNair, but there is no record of their presence there, unlike the other memorials on the State House grounds. And the other part of this series was inspired by the commemorative monument for the three young men who were killed during the Orangeburg massacre on the campus of South Carolina State University. And their um, images recorded by photographer Cecil Williams. And those images by Cecil inspired Dr. Tolalupe Falani, who is Nigerian, to create beautiful bronze casts of these young people who were sacrificed in the struggle for civil rights. And uh, this is a memorial on the campus of South Carolina State University, which also, as it happens, since it's an HBCU, and because Dr. Falani is Yoruba and from Nigeria, and the Yoruba descendants from the ancient cultures of Ile Ife, there's a direct connection between us and the thousand year old African tradition of bronze casting. And these portraits that he realized into three dimensions from the uh, images by Cecil Williams are really quite extraordinary. And so part of our purpose is to bring attention to these um, 
examples of the arts in Orangeburg County. And uh, this month long celebration uh, named in honor of Dr. Leo Twiggs and uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Arthur Rose of Claflin is uh, being brought to us by the Stanback Museum at South Carolina State University. And our partners, Omari uh, is a representative for the South Carolina Progressive Network, which is affiliated with the Majeska Simpkins School for Human Rights, which has ongoing discourses on these ideas of citizenship, equity, and equality. And this event has been a part of the newly inaugurated Twigs Rose Festival of the Arts in Orangeburg County, a celebration of our local HBCUs and of higher education institutions in Orangeburg in general, and of the idea of thinking and processing information as a community. And I'd like to thank everyone for having attended. And with that, we'll end our recording. <laughs>